Welcome to the program. Well, that was the voice of one of my guests that I'll bring on momentarily, but I would like to set the stage here before I do that because I've spent a good portion of the last three months examining the many aspects of how the world changed. This is back on October 7th of last year, and I want to revisit that for a few moments today. And while some I hear may be tiring of hearing about the Mideast tinderbox, the likelihood of the conflict spreading remains extremely high. And as I speak, Israel, remember, a nation the size of New Jersey, has enemies on seven fronts. Okay, let that sink in. Seven fronts. Yemen, Lebanon with Hezbollah, Gaza with Hamas, within Judea and Samaria, otherwise known as the West Bank, in Syria, in Iraq, and in Iran. These are the enemies staring down at that little nation. As I've stated also in previous programming, many Jews are going to be returning to Israel as a part of God's end-time plan. And I have a headline in front of me, Jerusalem Post, nearly half of British Jews considered leaving the UK due to the anti-Semitism. Another headline, I did read this one about a month ago, Times of Israel, Dear Diaspora Jews, It's Over. Subheadline, the past month has reinforced my belief, that's the author, that there is only one place we're meant to be, and it isn't New York, Buenos Aires, or London. Well, he's implying that the only safe place to be is Israel. This is going on all over the world. God's end-time plan, it centers on that nation and people, and he's moving the players on a chessboard What no one is saying out loud, I'm going to say it right here. It appears to me that America is also at war. Our troops are being attacked in various places of the Middle East. Our troops, in some capacity, fired on the Houthis here in the last week. And a weak White House has held back from handling any of this aggressively, which causes the radicals to be even more bold in parts of the Middle East, Iraq, Syria, the Houthis, etc., Instead, the Obama-Biden administration gives billions of dollars, that's billions with a B, to Iran so that she can keep this aggression up. In the category, folks, of I never thought I'd see the day, America arming Iran, who is sworn to the destruction of Israel and to the destruction of America, and yet we arm that nation, it has to top the list of I never thought I would see the day. How much of this would be leading to the nine wars of the end times, as Dave Reagan documented in this program a few months ago? I'm not really sure. But joining me for the hour from Lamb and Lion Ministry would be both Tim Moore and Nathan Jones. And we're going to discuss where some of this might be going here in 2024. At the very least, I think we can probably promise you a very bumpy ride this year. And gentlemen, welcome back to Understanding the Times Radio. We're very glad to be here. Yes, thank you, Jan. Tim, first, I opened with you quoting Adrian Rogers. It's growing gloriously dark. Let's clarify here right up front. We're not sharing the darkness nor the deeds of darkness. We're using them as the barometer of our times and of the lateness of the hour. The Bible says these things must happen, the things that we're watching. But again, we're not cheering for darkness, but it is a marker to us. Please clarify. That sentiment, as you said, does not celebrate the growing darkness, but it recognizes that this is yet another manifestation of the signs of the times God told us would occur nearing the end. We recognize all the conflicts in the world, all the tragedies as being part of the orchestration of human activity that God is bringing about his glorious plan. In hindsight, we can see that even the horror of the Holocaust, and that was a horror. We do not minimize the horror that it was to the Jewish people, but it became a motivation for so many Jews to leave Europe and to go to Israel. And I think we are seeing that yet again. It is wrong for Hamas to have attacked Israel. It is wrong for the world to be abandoning Israel. But it is prophesied in Scripture that these things will happen in order that the Jews will regather in the land of Israel, and God's great providence for them will come to fruition. Again, whether it's the wars relative to Israel, whether it's all the other signs of the times, the signs of nature, the signs of world politics, like you said, the chess pieces on the board being moved around, we as Christians don't need to despair. 
we need to recognize that God is still at work and his word is coming to pass. I watched a video of the two of you and you were reviewing 2023 and you picked out a few highlights. I'm going to add a couple more to them. And Nathan, let me address this question to you. You highlighted for 2023, we've been watching Israel. We've been watching artificial intelligence and the explosion of technology. We've been watching the Gog Magog coalition much stronger now. We've been watching the rise in globalism, obviously the rise in anti-Semitism, the continued decline of society, the threat of a wider war, perhaps even World War III, not being sensational, but kind of wondering. And as Tim just said, there are signs in nature. Now we've got earthquakes, Japan, Turkey, Iceland, How about the green agenda, the green dragon, which is always raising its head and trying to change society? But Nathan, some of those that I listed, there are many more we could list. Looking back on 2023, do you think that one or all of those are going to leap into this new year? Oh, Jan, I don't think signs of the times have anything to do with calendar years that humans make. We're just a few days in, and already it seems like the world's getting crazier and crazier. But if I could lead up to a point where we know this is going to go. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, the prophecy of the Lord defeating the Russian and Islamic coalition against them, we get to verse 27. It says, When I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and I am hollowed in them in the sight of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God who sent them into captivity among the nations, but brought them back into their land, and here's this, and left none of them captive any longer. That quote that you said in the beginning about the diaspora Jewry is coming to an end, I 100% agree because we know that the Lord is allowing the anti-Semitism so that the Jewish people return to Israel, where Israel becomes a crucible and a believing remnant comes out of it. And that's the destination for all this turmoil. I think the thing that has leaped out at me in 2023 heading into here in the new year is that the nations are in an absolute rage. They're in an uproar. You two had an interesting dialogue about that. Again, it's on video. I just want to play a couple of minutes of that clip of the two of you. I'm so glad you concluded it by, of course, what the Bible says, God sits in the heavens and laughs at all these nations that are in a rage, that are in an uproar. Well, Nathan, years ago, a psalmist wrote Psalm 2 talking about the nations being in an uproar and asking the rhetorical question, why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? And now, all these many years later, we see the nations still in an uproar, still angling for position and power, but over and over again devising vain things. I think it's because the powers behind them are satanic. Satan is called the god of this world. What are Satan's ambitions? We read in the book of Isaiah, his ambitions are to be worshipped like God, to have ultimate power, to eject God from his domain, and to rule and reign. And as fallen humans, what do we want? We want the same thing. What's that old song? Everybody wants to rule the world. And so these people, they ascend to power. And what do they want? They want to rule the world. Well, we've seen in just recent weeks how Iran, who has proven itself to be a nefarious actor on the world stage in so many ways, has convinced our own American administration to give back $6 billion of its oil revenue. And for what? Well, because they have taken hostage a handful of Americans who they agreed to release. And the danger in this is we as Americans have always resisted paying a ransom for hostages because once you start down that path, you create more hostage taking because you just do the math. Uh, Let's see, every American's worth about a billion point two dollars. If I take 10, I can have this much. It, it, It incites more of the same and yet The Biden administration has given the Iranians $6 billion with the fig leaf claim, well, they won't use it for evil actions. You know what? They free up $6 billion other dollars to do things that are horrific. And let's be very clear. Iran has stated that it wants to destroy Israel, to wipe it off the face of the map, and to destroy the great Satan, which is America. Why would our leaders even consider such a vain thing as this? It seems like the leaders who are the most humanist in nature, who have the least Bible background, tend to have no problem hugging any kind of dictator they want. Mm. They also usually tend to be uh, put their hearts and minds against Israel when it comes to policies. Uh, We know that Iran has a theocratic government through the Ayatollahs. Uh, God bless the people of Iran. They want to be free of that. They don't want to follow their government. 
but they're restricted and oppressed just like uh, they want to due to the Israelis. Uh, the, the Iran wages proxy wars through Hezbollah and Hamas and, and other organizations in an attempt to destroy Israel. And we read prophetically in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 that Iran will join a coalition yes, of nations will. led by Russia that will try to attempt to destroy Israel. So uh, even though it seems like these nations rage, like you said in Psalm 2, the Lord sits in heaven and he does what? He sits in heaven and laughs. And he laughs yeah. not because this is funny or because it is humorous, but because the, the puny efforts of mankind to thwart his will will come to absolute naught. That is why it is a vain or an empty thing. Gentlemen, that whole passage in Psalm 2, I'm so glad God put it in the Bible because here we get an image of God up there laughing. Again, he's not laughing at anybody's suffering, but he's laughing at the haughtiness of these foolish world leaders. I couldn't agree more. We don't understand from a human perspective God's sentiment, his deep love, and yet his absolute righteousness, which cannot countenance sin, his righteous indignation, we sometimes refer to as wrath, that is totally justified. That's what happens throughout Revelation as he pours out wrath during the tribulation. But even as he's pouring out wrath, his motive is to drive people to the end of themselves and toward repentance because his heart is that they would be saved. God laughs knowing that all the machinations of mankind to thwart his will, even Satan's efforts to keep God's will from coming to pass or to discredit the Lord God Almighty are laughable. And that's exactly what is conveyed yeah. in Psalm 2. We are witnessing with our own eyes how so many supposed world leaders who have been elevated to those positions by God yet are against him. They are anti-Christ in their efforts. We see that day by day, but God's will cannot be thwarted. It will come to pass. It has in these last number of years. And so we can see with great clarity in hindsight what God has been doing. And that gives us assurance that what he will continue to do till the end of time will be in accordance with his great prophetic word. Tim, your thoughts on that? Jan, you are exactly right to recognize that this is a Marxist agenda and not just advocating for Marxism, communism, but really it is a deconstruction mentality to tear down structures here in the West. And that's been a long game played by the Marxist world, but it is showing fruit because they have taken over most of academia. We can point to some of the Ivy League colleges recently that testify before Congress, and yet that attitude is rampant throughout the faculty. So the radicals of the 1960s came into power as they assumed college professorships and other positions of leadership. And now they are propagating that ideology to young people. And the ignorance is beyond belief, not only ignorance about the Holocaust, but ignorance about our own country, a manifest self-loathing by young people in the West who claim that everything Western, everything American is inherently evil. And so it has to be torn down and undone. And of course, as they look to Israel, they flip on the head the reality that Israel is a tiny country, as you already mentioned, surrounded by a sea of hate and animosity. And miraculously, the Lord has not only brought Israel into being once again within the last 75 plus years now, but he has protected them. And instead of realizing that Israel is the David amidst a bunch of Goliaths, now Israel is seen as the oppressor. And that's why the false mantra of genocide in Palestine is being perpetrated on college campuses. We could argue that the United States has allowed evil actors to come in, people who have a desire not to be educated, but really to spread propaganda, to spread hate. I've observed the only thing that the Palestinians have exported is hate and terrorism. And that has come here, at least in the hate, and I am told by very reliable sources that there are many who are ready to bring terrorism to this part of the world and to the West in general if we do not support even the evil ideology of Hamas. Nathan Jones, if Yasser Arafat were able to be watching all the things going on here today, which we know he isn't, but he would be proud, would he not? This whole movement came about because of him back in the 1960s. The concept of Palestinian people, it's just not in history. There's no culture. There's no music that the Palestinian people can claim because it really isn't a culture. you got to think Yasser Arafat right now knows better, right? Yeah, he's better. Torments in pain waiting for his final judgment at the Great White Throne Judgment. But again, all this was prophesied. We know for a fact 
that the Psalm 83 war will be coming as a Arab coalition comes to attack Israel. We know that Israel, according to Zechariah 12:6, will defeat this alliance. So as bad as it gets, we know that Israel will be victorious in this. Israel will then dwell in security and prosperity, as Ezekiel 38 says, in preparation for then a larger persecution, Russia and the Islamic nations coming against them. And that's where God then supernaturally steps in and defeats the enemies. And you can read in Ezekiel 39:29, And I will not hide my face from them, the Jews, anymore, for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. So we are at the darkest just before the dawn. It's going to look terrible right now, and it's going to get worse and worse, especially into the tribulation. But we know that the dawn is right around the corner. Certainly, they have come to their senses yeah. of the nature of people. I'm told of a proverb where a scorpion was about to drown in a river, and a woman went out to save the scorpion, and it immediately stung her. And people said, why did you try to save the scorpion? She said, well, I just felt compassion for it. But I came to realize that's the nature of the scorpion. It is going to sting because that's what scorpions do. People who have been raised to hate in satanic manner are going to hate, period. That is their nature. You know, one of the things that Nathan touched on is history. And Jan, I think that you said it right. We have to recognize the reality of history. And so Christians start with the Bible. We can go all the way back to Genesis where the Lord himself prophesied that the son of Abraham, by way of Hagar, would be a wild donkey of a man. His hand would be against everyone. And following down through the centuries of time, we can see that that has been the case. It is the case still today. But many Christians are oblivious of history, and we need to recognize the facts of history so that we can have hindsight. One of the things that the West rarely talks about is, you mentioned Nathan Jones receiving a doctorate. Mahmoud Abbas, who is the head of the Palestinian Authority in the so-called West Bank, has a doctorate in a denial of the Holocaust and in a claim that there was never any Jewish presence in Israel. Now, of course, he received this at a Muslim university, but he did doctoral work supposedly in the historical lie that the Holocaust never occurred and Israel was never present in Palestine prior to 1948. All you have to do is open the Bible and realize that is a lie. And so Christians cannot be deceived. We have to be students of the Word of God. We have to recognize history. And I would submit, Jan, that if we do, we can have better discernment even than some of the prophets who are recording God's Word because we can see with absolute clarity what has transpired over these past 2,000 years and indeed the last 75 years. And that goes to the sad reality that even in 1948, Many churches didn't recognize the miracle of Israel in 1967, 1973. They didn't recognize the miracle of God's protection. And even today, so many are being duped by satanic forces and by propagandists that have infiltrated our own Western world to not recognize that God is at work, but that this is a very fraught moment for the Jewish people. I'm going to get into this here in just a minute or two in part two of my programming, Tim, because you have written about the times of the Gentiles, a fascinating article. I can't read it, but I can read two paragraphs of it. Just what are the times of the Gentiles? Most of my listening audience would be Gentiles and few Jewish people. viciously murdered in the, what should have been a safe place. There are bullet holes in the ceiling, the walls, everywhere. Yeah. And uh, these Hamas terrorists came 
and showed them no mercy. And we are all, uh, I think, feeling a real sense of just uh, being gut punched by the whole experience of walking through this carnage and realizing that uh, precious, innocent, civil uh, human beings that weren't military were slaughtered in their own home by these uh, uncivilized savages. So we're here in Kibbutz Kfar Aza, where uh, some of the worst atrocities happened on October 7. And uh, earlier we talked to um, families of the hostages who are alive, but they're taken in Gaza. Mm -hmm. And now we hear um, where they were taken from. What is the impact of that on you? Could you talk about that? The fact that hostages have been taken from 25 different countries uh, and still being held is a reminder this is not just about Israel. It's certainly front and center. But this is about all those 25 nations who had civilian people who were kidnapped and taken into Gaza to be used as human shields and bargaining chips um, who, who should never have been involved in all of this. And I want the world to unite and be angry. Angry at Iran for providing the money. Angry at these Hamas terrorists. The modern nation of Israel was established May 14, 1948, but the old city of Jerusalem, including Mount Zion, continued to be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until 1967. And then you say, Tim, and I'm winding down here, toward the end of the Six-Day War, Israel recognized a brief window of opportunity to recapture Jerusalem. Its military goals did not include the ancient capital. In fact, Israel had urged Jordan to stay neutral during the hostilities. But Jordan's pride and God's will aligned to create an opening for the Jews to reclaim the city. And here's where I'll wind this down. Tim, you write, Despite having Luke 21, 24, countless other prophetic scriptures and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, most Gentile Christians were oblivious to the significance of that moment. And you say, I've asked scores of believers who lived through that period about their reaction in their churches. They testify to overwhelming apathy to the events taking place half a world away. And you conclude, Tim, the rising turmoil of Vietnam and growing unrest at home clamored for far more attention than the goings-on in Israel. And you say this is a sad commentary on contemporary Christianity. In other words, Tim, the churches yawned back in 1967 when this historic happening took place in Jerusalem. I maintain they're still yawning. Many are even still yawning over what happened on October 7th they are. And it's not only in 1967, with the same could be said of 1948. At one point, I did meet people who lived in that time frame, and it was the same reaction. Most people were oblivious, even within Christian circles, because they simply were not looking for the fulfillment of God's prophetic word, so they didn't recognize it when it came to pass. 1967, we could add to that all of the other conflicts when people are so focused inwardly here in America. We're very self-centered sometimes in our worldview and didn't recognize from a biblical perspective, which is why Nathan and I and you, Jan, emphasize that we need to be students of God's prophetic word so that we can have understanding when these very events come to pass. And certainly God did have a provision to include the Gentiles in his great plan of salvation, Paul makes that case in Romans 9 through 11, as he is still asserting the primacy of Israel, the Jewish people. And he even says that the fact that the gospel went to the Gentiles was an effort for God to allow them to make the Jewish people jealous of the relationship we have with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and with the Jewish Messiah revealed in the person of Yeshua, Jesus Christ. And yet so many Gentiles don't understand that dynamic of God's continuing provision for the Jewish people and for Israel. When we do, it invigorates our faith. It excites us about the very things that we are witnessing going on in the world today, back to that idea of it's getting gloriously dark, and it gives us an intentionality about blessing the Jewish people. And not just in some nebulous term, but seek a particular Jew that you can be a blessing to. Look for every opportunity to bless the Jewish people. Really, even these last number of weeks has been a test of how 
Gentile Christians are going to respond? Are we going to pour out love and support for the Jewish people in Israel and elsewhere with the rise of anti-Semitism? Or are we going to yawn and go back to our own lives and our own business? I think the Lord is giving us yet another opportunity to bless the Jews, just as was commanded through the prophecy to Abraham. Those who bless you, I will bless. And certainly we need to heed that prophetic word. Nathan, you as Internet Outreach Minister there, what are you hearing from those who write to you? And I'm talking now, staying in the vein of this conversation, about a church response to all that's going on. What I'm hearing is the division inside families, Mm. that just like politics, we seem to be in an age now where families can't get together now because of the politics. If your parents have conservative views, then you shouldn't talk to them. Well, this division is happening where families are getting split apart by members who support the Palestinian side. So the traditional Christians who understand the importance of Israel have relatives, friends, even children who aren't talking with them or fighting with them because they see now them as evil for taking the side of Israel. This has become what Jesus says, that he would be a stumbling block to people, and Jerusalem would break the nations apart. Well, it's breaking families apart. So right now, most of the questions that seem to be coming in here at Lamb and Lion Ministries are related to My child says that Israel, blah, 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 and they say the Palestinians are poor and oppressed, blah, blah, blah. Do you have any scriptures or have any articles Mm. about that? And we do. How can they get a hold of that? Right on our website at ChristInProphecy.org or our Christ in Prophecy YouTube channel. ChristInProphecy.org or the YouTube channel. I'm going to play one more clip, and it's going to be an introduction to this whole concept of the Muslim Messiah, the Mahdi, and then I want you gentlemen to explain to my audience why this is a key to what is going on. And until we understand this, we can't possibly understand the scope of all that's happening in what the Bible calls the center of the earth. But here, God placed that little nation of Israel, again, the size of New Jersey, right in the heart of Mahdi land, which means right in the heart of the Islamic world that wants to bring about chaos. And the more chaos that Iran could bring about, the more likely that her Mahdi will come on the scene, her Messiah, the guided one, Iran has been indoctrinating its fighters throughout the Middle East in the belief that Israel is the biggest obstacle to the return of the Mahdi and that there must be an apocalyptic war that destroys both Israel and Jews around the world. Islamic expert Raymond Ibrahim. So the Mahdi, as as an English speaker would pronounce it, it's really Mahdi, which basically means guided. So he's the guided one or an Islamic understanding. He's the rightly guided one. And he takes on different guises, depending on which sect of Islam you ask, Sunni or Shia. Sunnis, the majority of the world's Muslims, believe the Mahdi has not yet been born. The Prophet said, hadith is in Abu Dawood, a man shall come towards the end of times. His name will be my name, and the name of his father will be the name of my father, meaning Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Shia Islam, which is dominated by Iran, teaches that the Mahdi is already alive and has been hiding for over a thousand years. Brother Rashid, a former Muslim, hosts a Christian program for Muslims called Daring Questions. The Shia Muslims, uh, especially the Twelver Shiism, they believe that he is the twelfth Imam and he was born around 868, so he just disappeared. He's still alive until today. His age is 1155, if you want to. So he's still living somewhere. And um, one day he will show himself. Muslims in Iran believe the Mahdi is hiding in this well in the mosque of Jamkaran. Pilgrims peer down the well with flashlights, leave prayer requests for the Mahdi and hope he will reappear. Muslims believe that when the Mahdi returns, he will be accompanied by Jesus, known in Islam as the Prophet Isa, to rid the world of evil. Iranian leaders have seized upon belief in the final battle before the Mahdi's return to motivate its military and allies to fight harder to destroy Israel. And a lot of the, you know, Islamic schools or jihadists, are being indoctrinated by by Iranian propaganda in in Mahdism, and again, it always centers around Israel and attacking and destroying Israel. Some believe in the next phase of its plan to wipe out Israel, Iran might initiate a multi-front attack through its heavily armed proxy armies in Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq. 
Ibrahim and Brother Rashid say the doctrine of the Mahdi's return means that any attempts by Israel to make peace with the Muslim world will ultimately prove to be futile. Israel is a threat to Muslims, to the Mahdi, to the coming of the Mahdi Saudi, they have to be eliminated. There is no, no other solution. So I don't think Israel could ever have permanent peace unless Islam were to completely change itself and become not Islam, to be something completely different. And Ibrahim worries that Iran might be willing to use a nuclear weapon against Israel to ensure the return of the Mahdi. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. Jan Markell have on the line from Texas, Nathan Jones, and also Tim Moore. Gentlemen, your thoughts on this. Let me start with you, Nathan, and you have expounded on this before. I want you to update it. Yeah, I've taught on it many times because there's this general idea that the Mahdi, this Islamic savior, will be the Antichrist. And we got to bear in mind that the Hadith took elements of the Torah, the New Testament, and Zoroastrianism, threw them in a blender, and came up with this end-time viewpoint. But it's a very dangerous end-time viewpoint because the Ayatollahs of Iran firmly believe that if they can get the Middle East to explode in a war, like a consummate war across the Middle East, the Mahdi will come in, they will defeat the Jewish people, conquer the world, and the Ayatollahs then will be rulers of this world. Back in your first segment, you mentioned that in the end, what do people want? They want, like Satan, to rule the world. And that's what the Ayatollahs are doing. And that's why they're so desperate to start a war against unseemingly large numbers. But yes, this Mahdi is supposed to come, and he's supposed to arrive at this time called the Hour. He's going to fight this guy called the Dajjal, which is their version of the Antichrist. number of signs will happen. Again, a lot of it's nonsense. But this end-time view, this lie that they believe, will cause and has caused such great harm in the Middle East and so many deaths. Tim, you want to add to that, please? It's not just the belief in the Mahdi, which has motivated Iran since 1979 as the Ayatollah returned. Iran, at one time, had been one of the most peaceful parts of the Middle East as an ally of the United States and actually as a secret ally to Israel until they were radicalized by this false theology. But there's also ideologies. What a lot of Westerners don't realize is that the forebear of Hamas, and even the Palestinians, was the Muslim Brotherhood that originated in Egypt. And this absolute nationalistic, fervent Muslim ideology infiltrated so many parts of the Middle East. And to this day, it is banned in Egypt, but it is the forefather of Hamas that motivated Yasser Arafat and others, and now Hamas. If you watch the news just from the last several weeks, you would see that in parts of Africa, that there has been a dramatic increase in the slaughter of Christians yes. by radicalized yes. Muslim followers of the Muslim Brotherhood. So this false ideology, it infects places around the world and motivates people to act satanically because it is a satanic ideology let alone a satanic theology. So Satan is pulling out all the stops, given that the time is short, and he recognizes the signs of the times, even if we don't. And that's why he's trying to foment so much destruction, so much calamity, so that he can attempt to thwart the will of God. Very well said. I think that sums up a rather complicated issue. Again, the Mahdi can't understand anything, at least that part of the world, without better understanding the eschatology, at least of Shiite Islam. And gentlemen, Shiite Islam wants to obliterate Sunni Islam. Iran wants to obliterate Saudi Arabia because it's a different brand of Islam. So there's no loyalty over there. It goes back to the wild donkey of man, those who are descendants in either genealogy or ideology of Hagar's son. And so Ishmael's offspring have always been against each other and the world. We as Christians need to go back to a realization Jesus in Matthew 13, 17 said, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see the things that you are seeing, but didn't see them and hear the things you hear, but didn't hear them. We live in an era when we have hindsight, when we can witness the very signs of the times coming together, coalescing, converging, as we like to say. And it's an exciting period if we have eyes to see and ears to hear. We need to go to the Word of God. We need to be students of history from the perspective of the Word of God, and then we can be encouraged and not discouraged. We don't have to be optimists looking through rose-colored glasses, but we can be exactly what the Bible talks about, people of hope, because we have our eyes on our blessed hope, Jesus Christ. 
Again, you can reach my guest, Tim Moore, Nathan Jones, ChristInProphecy.org, ChristInProphecy.org. Nathan, I came across one of your articles that I believe Harbinger's Daily reprinted, 10 Reasons Why God Gave Us Bible Prophecy, and I want to wind down our hour. We can't look at all 10, but let me just highlight the 10 points and ask you to comment on one or two of them. You say in this article, did you know that a whopping 31% of the Bible is God revealing how events will unfold before they happen? Our Heavenly Father wants His children to know what the future holds. And then you give these 10 reasons why God gave us these insights, and I'll state them. Number one, it shows that God speaks the truth. Number two, it proves that the Bible is God's word. Number three, it shows that God is in control. Number four, it demonstrates God's love. Number five, Bible prophecy describes God's plan. Number six, eschatology demonstrates God's might. And number seven, the topic here proves God is worthy. Number eight, eschatology promises evil will be punished. I'm going to come back and revisit that in just a minute. Number nine, it prepares us to get right with him. And number 10, eschatology gives us hope. Nathan, I'm just revisiting number eight for a moment here. It promises evil will be punished. And I want to comment, and then I want your comment. Because I think many of us, I'm going to start with myself, we get very discouraged. We seem to see that evil wins all the time. We have corruption on overdrive in our nation's capital in Washington, D.C., possibly in the highest office in the whole country, riddled with corruption. And we get discouraged because we think, will truth ever prevail? We have, again, as Tim just highlighted, righteous people being persecuted all over the world. So your point number eight, I really resonated with, it promises evil will be punished. Why don't you explain that? That's the wonderful thing about God is he is sovereign, he is judge. So we look around, and you're right, it's called the problem of evil. It's an apologetics term is that people lose their faith or never come to faith in God because they see evil all around them. They Mm. say, well, God doesn't do anything about it. So how can there be a sovereign God over the universe? But prophecy promises that God will step in, he will defeat evil, and he will set up his glorious kingdom on this earth, and all of history will end with the great white throne judgment. Evil will get punished. It doesn't happen as fast as we humans would like it, but it's a promise that God made in the Bible. And when prophecy comes true, we know God's word comes true, and we know that this will happen, that evil will be punished one day. And that gives us hope when we see all these evil players running around the world, that their time will come. Tim, you want to add to that? Nathan is exactly right. It's something that your viewers obviously are drawn to this program because you speak truth into a very dark world by opening the light of God's Word. That's exactly what we try to do. I would just again emphasize, we should not be discouraged even though Satan is raging, even though people who have been radicalized and propagandized are raging on college campuses and the streets of our cities, even in your neighborhood, Jan. That's right. Because the Lord told us all of these things would take place. He said, in this world, we will have trouble. I always point out that is external to us. The world around us is troubled, and so sometimes that trouble impacts us externally. But he also said, don't let your heart be troubled. In terms of inside, our spirit, our heart, can be absolutely at peace because we know the one true God and Savior. We know the revealed Messiah, Jesus Christ, and we can take absolute confidence that his word is true, that he is coming again soon and very soon for us. He's prepared a place for us, and the glories that await us are far in excess of anything terrible and tragic that is happening in our lives today. So again, it's a message of encouragement and hope, and I would leave our viewers with that strong encouragement. Nathan's 10th point here, Bible prophecy gives us hope. And Nathan, you write, I'll just read a few lines here. You said, the Lord wants us to understand how the future will play out. Sure, there are valleys in life we must traverse, and terrifying times are coming, like the tribulation, which is hard to digest. But you say, but prophecy is meant to give us hope that this evil age will end. 